Hey, in the Keep listeners, looking to get your horror fix this fall? Check out Fearzine. Fearzine is a physical and digital magazine focused on horror games, nostalgia, and titles from indie studios and developers. We are currently running our Kickstarter for issue two and have lots of cool goodies available. Find the link in the description and help us deliver an awesome physical magazine featuring over 70 horror video games. been a flux between video games and uh, other media as well. Mm. Uh, something that you've talked really openly about over the past, I, I'd say, that, but especially this last year, yeah, you started to get more and more open about, like, I really want to be more than just the video game guy. You yeah. put out albums, you've you really branched out. Yeah, and... <laughs> And I have to tell you, like it. I say it, albums. It, yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and I think it's it's when I, I, I'm like even getting emotional thinking about it. So it, you're right. I don't want to just be the guy who makes video game soundtracks anymore. I don't want. I don't want that. In fact, when I first got started in making music, it wasn't really even on my list. I'm being completely honest. Like I love. I grew up with video game soundtracks. I love them. I love making them, but when I first got into music, it wasn't like, "Ooh, I want to be a video game composer." Like that never crossed my mind. I never thought I would be, have anything to do with video games. Right, right. You know, it, it just fell into my lap. That yeah. That's how my early twenties turned out. That is literally. I mean, you that phrase I have used in presentations, uh, webinars, whatever. I've used that same phrase. It fell into my lap. Um, so. What I'm working on now is, well, I am working on three soundtracks. So there's, of course, Call of Sagnar, which I've been working on for, I think it's almost coming up on a <laughs> almost coming up on a decade. But there have been a couple of years, there have been like at least a few years during that stretch where I didn't even touch the music. You know, it's been such a, there was so much back end, I think probably in 2019, 2020, where I didn't even touch it, you know? So, um so there's that game. There's, uh, I just signed on to another one. It's kind of a spiritual successor to, uh, skies of Arcadia. It's called horizons of Achaia. And it's, a, a, I think the developer's based in Indiana. Uh, great guy. Okay. Amazing guy. Um, so I just signed on to do, to do music for that. And I'm working on another one that's been on under pretty heavy NDA since 2022. That one's coming to a close in this upcoming March. I'll be done with them. Um, and I think they told me that the game itself won't be, I think they said production even later into 2028. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. It's, but it's just you. It's just that you'll be done making the music. Yeah, I'll It'll be done continue. the music in 25. Yeah. yeah, so I'm not allowed to say anything about it. So um, there's no one's heard a thing from it, but the soundtrack's gigantic. Um, but either way, so that's like kind of on, oh, and there's, uh, I forgot about Evercraft Online. <laughs> that's terrible of me. Uh, so I haven't written music for them probably over the last year or so. They're doing a lot of back end stuff, but I'm going to be kicking up again with them probably this this fall, this this winter. Um, so again, it's it's almost like I have just a bunch that are sort of happening concurrently, but it's not like I work on all of them every day. Uh, it just ebbs and flows like Evercraft again. Like haven't touched that for a year or so, but now it'll be kicking off again soon. Um, so there's that. It's just it's such a hustle. It is, man. Like the, the art of being a musician or a sound designer <laughs> it, or anything oh. at all in the games industry, especially in this day and age, is such a like, you, you got to be like old, like 1996 Atlanta level right. gangster hustle. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, and now you have to be a whole outcast album and a bag of fried chicken to like get my right. life. Well, and, and it's, that's, it's, yeah. I think it's that's hard. Yeah, it is. It's hard. And it's part of the reason why it's, I would say it's on the lower tier reason why I probably in 2022, I was like, I want to, I want to do more. That's just me. 
I want to make more music and create a fan base and create an audience and frankly, create a business surrounding music that's just me, that's not attached to a video game or a documentary or this. And I have, I've got nothing wrong with those uh, media forms. I got nothing wrong with it. I think it's beautiful and it's wonderful, but I there's always been a part of me that just wants to reach the listeners just through the music. Like that's it. Nothing in between. Um, so I've got the soundtracks, but I'm also working on my next album, uh, which is going to be a bit more, I'd say symphonic pop. It almost, it's almost, it's leaning into like, I'm not talking like Ed Sheeran pop or like Taylor Swift pop. I'm talking maybe more like Ben Folds pop or like 2011 Coldplay pop. You know, like I, it's, it's a bit more of that. Um, I have a couple other singles this year I want to crank out, but it's really, I'm really sitting in this, these two departments. Would you ever consider going on one of these television series that are like a competition for a singer? Like, so like <laughs> I grew up with, and I always thought that, by the way, I just preface every question I would ask with like, my answer is lame, but not, nah. uh, like American Idol, the voice. Yeah. Would you ever consider <laughs> doing a season <laughs> i think i'm too old for american idol <laughs> so there's that <laughs> but or the mass singer yeah yeah I, people have and by people i i mean you know family and friends you know the they, they've often asked me like oh when are you going to audition for the voice i'm like ah i don't i don't know i don't think i'd ever fit the bill for for that i think i more so want to I want to create music that, oh gosh, this is going to sound terrible. If anyone's been on The Voice, just forgive me. But it's, 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 I want it to be less of a show and more so about meaning, more so about the message. And that obviously can take place on something like The Voice, but I, I don't want to, in short, I guess I don't want to feel like a sellout. I don't want to feel like, ooh, I want some competition and now people know me because I want some competition. It's like, I'd, I'd rather it be about, I want to find the people who are there for the message, the meaning. So, so that's what's so interesting about uh, my relationship with you is basically I always send you music that I feel like you, you there's no chance you know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> like I'm just trying to impress you with my immense knowledge of the ether ethereal, you know, outer expanse of what music is. Yeah. And then when you send me music, it's like the other day you sent me a Daughtry. <laughs> And I was like, Chris Daughtry, yeah. the guy who didn't even win American Idol. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> and I listened to it and I'm like, actually, this for, you know, this, I get what he's trying to say. I get what he's, I, you know, he's, he's got a point. And it made me question myself. It's like this whole idea that I had about being you know, like, I'm, I'm supposed to be a hipster. I'm supposed to have this like yeah. hardcore idea of what music is. And then the people who I respect the most are like coming at me with this stuff that I consider like, oh, pop nonsense. Yeah. There's a reason why it's popular, of course. Um, it's it's very frustrating. I won't lie about that. <laughs> That's okay. Coldplay, yeah. like you you being a huge Coldplay fan. <laughs> sure, for me, like I, I grew up uh, in like Metallica and Megadeth yeah. were my favorite bands. Like yeah. Slipknot were my favorite bands. Uh, I love I love Mastodon. Slipknot, These are all great. Yeah, yeah, of course they are. But uh, <laughs> Coldplay wasn't on the list. Yeah, <laughs> or, yeah. Um, it, you kind of opened my eyes to a different way of thinking, you know, a little bit more, maybe, maybe a more Zen way of life because I was so fucking angry as a teenager. But I'm well, still angry. You know, I, yeah. Why I, am I still angry? Uh, Fix it for me. Play me a song that makes me feel. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write you a song, my friend. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And you know, it's an interesting, and I think that's where I've personally always sort of struggled if you know i sort of identifying myself as a musician composer songwriter whatever you know we could talk in length about what identity means and i i you know i i personally identify much more deeply than like oh i'm a composer in fact i would love if people would just stop saying i'm a composer and start saying i compose music you know you are so much more than a being someone who writes music like, you're so much more just by being human you know anyway that's a whole tangent but i think where I've kind of struggled as a musician is because my interests are so diverse 
right? Like I don't live for video game music. I don't like eat, sleep, breathe, poop, <laughs> video game music. You know, like I love rap. I love hip hop. I love heavy metal. I love hard rock, pop, pop rock, orchestral, like give me a, give me an, a, a classical symphony, you know, like that. I love all of it. And I think there's beauty in all of it. There can be beauty in all of it. And there can be such powerful messaging behind all of it that I hate boxes, man. Like, I don't like being in a box, period. Me neither. Like, think about the history of me as a podcaster. Yeah. It's like, I originally started off with like a, a show that was just about local wrestling and local music. Like, whatever like was popular mm. in show business in the hometown. And then- you know, that went away for years. I come back with arena FPS games. Right. And then I come back with like, no, that's not enough. There's only like seven of those. Uh, okay. Boomer shooters. And then there's like, okay, well, there's only 20, 26 of those. What else do we do? And then we just kept going and going and going until it mm. became bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's, that's the way to be about pretty much anything. Right. Um, so I, I think that it's, it's just a matter of staying open-minded staying uh vigilant to kind of like what the zeitgeist is but also like what is it about the modern time that you vibrate with like don't just follow people's blind idea of what they think is cool right but like what's cool to you and how can you continue to make that uh, right something that you know vibrates with who you are in your soul well nice that, yeah absolutely and i i think for me if you want to think of it on a more superficial level is uh the orchestra I love, I love any chance I get to use an orchestra in any capacity. Like I would love nothing more than if someone like NF, if you know the artist NF, like if he were to just come up to me, just send me a DM on, on Instagram because that'll never happen. But it, it'd be amazing if he just said, Hey man, like I would love, can, I'm doing an orchestra tour. Like, can you orchestrate this stuff? I love any capacity. I have the chance to work with an orchestra. I'm in, I am in. So that's on the superficial level. But then I think on a deeper level. I th I think you nailed it. It's like you we all we all kind of move through life in a certain way. Like there was a time where I thought all I'd be doing when I really got started with V game soundtracks, there was a time where I thought, okay, this is it. This is what I must be doing. And then it was after I scored mine the Minecraft Universal uh project earlier, you know, almost a year ago I worked on that music. Um I sort of hit this threshold where I was like, okay, so I did this cool thing, got money to do it, okay? And it was then that it really hit me in thinking about like, there's so much more that I'm made to do. So I think yeah. there's this, there's a, there's a natural trajectory of life that I think, I think we're, 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 we're lying to ourselves if we think that we're going to be doing one thing for the rest of our life, period. I think it's silly. I think it, it, it is, Unless you just somehow live in one lane for literally sixty years plus, you're gonna you're there's there's gonna be an inevitable ebb and flow and transitions to there and and needing to do all that because you're low in income that month or that may open a door for something else entirely. Like that's just gonna happen, man. It's just gonna happen. There's always gonna be a common denominator. You know, like, yeah. it might be as simple as like survive, but it also right. might be as simple as just like, you know. Well, no matter what I do, no matter what capacity I'm going to do it, in, I'm always going to be in music or I'm always going to be in show right. business right? You know, or something like that. Right. Uh, which, is, which is, to, for me, very true. Uh, I don't, you know, even the most mundane job I've ever had was still like I was performing. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, there's something to that, it, you know, podcast production, whatever the, whatever the heck it is. Right. I always wanted to be, you know, it, beholden to someone else's approval right in terms of my performance which i think is perfectly normal especially for a young person yeah whereas for you i imagine a lot of it is uh contract work so you're basically having to sort of produce something that in any in most cases an individual is going to approve of and then i would imagine that it also becomes more complicated when that game like or whatever it is that you you know your project if it gets picked up by right yeah uh, a publisher or an investor how do they treat you and i'm curious how like how does that translate into you know your 
yeah. stability within this business. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll leave it at this. I've had my I've had my interactions with publishers at times, and you're right. It does it does it does make things when there's more moving parts, man. I, I that's why I, I I feel like you know my I think my very first video game I ever worked on I was more of an assistant. It was back in 2013, 14. It's called Two Brothers by Axe Studios. Great guys. And in for, fact, it was for, it was for context. I was graduating high school. <laughs> yeah, I think it was my first year of college, and he, the the lead developer of the team, Axe Studios, uh, he and I are we're buddies, and we've been we've been kind of buddies since since that time. We went to school together, and he said, "Hey, I'm working on a game with my brother. Like, do you want to help me with the music?" I'm like, "Sure." Um, but then when I really started doing my own solo work in in about 2015 or 16 or so, um, I I quickly realized. The more moving parts there are, more team members involved, the more people you kind of have to go through for approval, it it does get challenging. And at times it can be frustrating. And that's just the nature of the job. That's fine. That's that's how it rolls. But I think for me, it's always been a matter of I just want to make music. And that's always been where I have tried to 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 put my path on the the, the brick beneath my feet is I just want to make music. That's all I want to do. I want to make music that people remember. I want to make music that people are moved by. I want to make music that means something, even if it's in the context of a fictional story. It'd be better, you know, if if there's a you know huge sweeping story that it's associated with. That's it. That's I thrive on that, you know. Um, but it it's always been about the music. Uh, and especially over the last couple of years when there's a lot of conversation about like dynamic programming and this, that, and the other, and like all the multi-layered stuff that can go into music implementation. I think for those who really want to geek out about it, that's great. I'll leave you to it. You can implement it for me. How about that? But it is, I don't want to say it put a sour taste in my mouth, but it's like, man, I just, I got into this because I just want to make, I just want to make great music. And it was, it was in that realization, again, probably around 2022 or so, that it, it, 2021 maybe, that it was like, I got, I just got to make music for, for me, for, for people who want to hear it. I just, I have to get out of this treadmill part of this industry. And I just got to make music that's just about these tunes, these messages, these lyrics, these arrangements, you know, um, and I never thought when I first got into game soundtracks, I never thought I'd be saying that. We're like, I don't want to say like, ooh, get me out of it, but more so like I need something else in, in addition to it. Uh yeah. No, I get it. Uh so for me, I remember this is probably like six months ago, the dead of winter in Denmark. And I had uh gone to a house party and had carried my acoustic guitar with me. I had mm. this like really sick, like like four or five hundred dollar uh, Esteban uh, acoustic guitar, which ironically are are actually built, handcrafted in Den Denmark, which really? I was like super like what the what the hell really? <laughs> totally true, they are. Um, so I love that guitar. Yeah, uh, I played it nearly every day. But so I, I took it to this house party, and I woke up the next day, and it was like you know kind of a slag. I'm like I have a hangover. Yeah. Gotta get home. Take a takes a, ta uh, a taxi cab because you know, you can't get an Uber in okay. the Scandinavian countries for the most part. Okay. It's, it's extremely expensive if you're even allowed to get one. Wow. So then I, uh, no, it's true. So then this guy picks me up and he's like, "Yo, you're a guitar player." And I'm like, "I guess so." And he's like, "Do you play? Uh, you know, like locally?" I'm like, "Nah." He's like, "Just for family and friends." I'm like, "Yeah, pretty much." Yeah. So that's probably the best way. And I was like, yep. And that was like a good bonding experience between yeah. me and this total stranger. But I, I used that's to beautiful. really want to be a performer in that in that regard. And I, I realized that I do want to be a performer, but not necessarily in, in music because mm -hmm. music is so personal to me. Mm -hmm. it's so like, it's something that I really, really savor for like when it's an extremely personal intimate environment and to like share it with the whole world would be so exhausting it would take so much mm. out of me i don't know that i could do it no i hear you there man 
I hear you. And I think you, you have, you, you touch on something that's very special and that music can be very personal. And it is, I mean, I think just by the nature of literally creating music live, it's extremely personal. And I think it's why, honestly, the whole COVID thing was so challenging. Um, heck, you know, you mentioned Coldplay. I, I, I distinctly remember an interview with uh, the lead singer. He mentioned that it really took a toll on him and his mental health because, gosh, you're playing, if you're playing in 60,000 person stadiums, like every week to have all of that sort of stripped away for you for like a year, you know? Um, even though there's elements of his music that's pretty personal, that it's it's still like, like it's almost like it he you can wrap performance around into your own existence. Like it's just, it's such a part of you, you know? Like when you're playing music, it's such a part of you. But I think on the other hand, on the other hand, I think that's why I crave it. I think that's why I crave, I crave not just being a dude sitting in here day in, day out, making just boss battle number 68, whatever. Like, I think there's an element of me that I crave the human connection. I am in front of people, they're listening to me and we're, we're meeting in real time, in real life, even if they're strangers to say, hey, here's a song about when I had anger issues. Like if that can reach somebody and potentially make them think about their own anger issues and to say, look, I really messed up. I was really disrespectful with my anger issues and that hits them and they say, okay, well, let me maybe go to therapy or let me, let me change. Like to me, that's what music's about is to make you think, to make you reflect, to feel, just to feel, man, just to feel what's going on. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to immediately retract it with like, it's the most insensitive thing that I could ever say. And it's like, it's not logical to think this, <laughs> but you seem so innocent that to someone who maybe lived a more rated R version of life might be like even afraid to you know, even though you're their beacon of light, like, oh, look how fucking awesome Tony is. It's like I'm, I'm not as awesome as you think. <laughs> I know that, and I know that. Trust me, but it's just you come across so wholesome, and uh, it's something I hope to emulate because I want I people that. to. I want you know, in the same way that you think that, like, oh, he he looks at me and he thinks like I'm such a good guy. He's so wrong. He doesn't realize <laughs> all the sins that I've done along the way and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But I feel the same way also, you know, someone mm. else brings the same thing. I was like, oh, I realize that you think I'm such a good beacon, but I'm just trying to make up for some shit I did in the past. Yeah. Like, I, it's not even about you, to be honest. I'm just yeah. paying my toll. <laughs> to get into the, forget about getting to heaven, to get to Hades yeah. at best. <laughs> oh, man. And so no, honestly, it's a, it's such an honor to know someone like you who is so positive and who does have such a uh, good outlook on you know what can be done with your own actions in in humanity. Uh, as you were saying earlier, like kind of your view of you know what your contribution of music is to the world is like, does it spread joy? Does it spread happiness? Does it spread well being? Um, and I wanted to, if possible, kind of get into your view of spirituality and sure. what does that mean to you. Absolutely. Uh, you've been very open about it in many other programs. So like, I don't yeah. really feel bad about asking you about it. No. So yeah. Sure. Tell me, tell me. Can from, we. From the bottom to the top. Let's start from the beginning. Come can I, up. can I first talk about the idea of spreading positivity, joy, well-being, that sort of thing? Can I just briefly yeah. touch on that? Is that okay? No, you can do whatever you want. Okay. So, <laughs> All right. I, and this interview, see it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, that's, I don't want to do that at all. Um, I I think the message I want to spread is more so about consolation, right? Which may not necessarily translate to joy or happiness even, or whatever, you know, uplifting, whatever it is, like feel good. I think consolation, knowing that someone else out there has been through something that you're going through. Right. It's almost like they've done studies on if someone's depressed, that the people 
that there's a, a large number, I forget the, I forget the percentages, but a, a good number of people who they feel better. If they're depressed, they feel better when they listen to sad music because it consoles them. It makes them feel like they're not the only ones in the universe dealing with what they're dealing with. Just so today. Con- go ahead. Consolation or constellation uh, share with uh, the idea of alignment. Right. So to, to feel that you are in alignment with someone or something or an idea is comforting. Right. It's very, it's extremely comforting, man. I mean, and I just had an interaction today, earlier today, li- like literally three hours ago. Uh, there, there was a, uh, an individual who, who said they were watching my YouTube. Oh, you know, I saw your wife in one of the music videos. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, she was like, but your music's so sad. Like, and I'm like, yeah, that's okay. It's okay. It's okay for music to be sad. It's okay for us to go through periods where we're (laughs) sad, you know? And I think there's a generational thing too with, with music. I I think of, uh, for lack of better words, you know, I think of like the, the, uh, you know, the baby boomer generation where it is, it's, it was like that everything's got to be feel good. You got like, we can't sit with, with the, the, the negative emotions. We can't sit with the well, feelings. It's everything in the fifties and sixties is about like the music is either I'm sad because I'm not in love or I'm in love. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And exactly. I'm going to kill you because you don't love me back. Yeah. And like yeah. my last album was like, well, I had uh angry emotional outbursts that nearly ruined my marriage, but we found redemption through God. <laughs> so like, I mean, it goes, it goes into the mud, man. It goes, it goes, it gets in there. It gets in there, which is a good segue, but which is what. That's extraordinarily more deep than a lot of people are even get a standage. But I think yeah, we, we all got to start somewhere though. You know what I'm saying? Like Ask the biggest pop stars in the world today and it's almost taboo for them. To say. If they said that God had anything to do with it, that's a strike against them on the Disney totem pole. Yep. That's fine, you know I mean? man. I'm not looking to be on the Disney totem pole. So. <laughs> what I'm saying is that like, if you e- even mention the word, that's such a, it's, that is taboo. Now I grew up and I, I knew you have your own yeah. you know, rural background story, but like I grew up in the, the outskirts of Mobile, Alabama. I have very, you know, even by my mother's own progressive standards and extraordinarily conservative and like, right. you know, backwoods quote unquote style of upbringing. And then yeah. I had to like kind of educate myself mm-hmm. by going through the military, by going through you know, school yeah. and everything. And then to look at like the, the way that I was, you know, brought up to believe how the world works versus how the, you know, the, the, let's say zeitgeist or narrative mm-hmm. nowadays would have you believe it's such an odds and it's such a strange world to live in. Mm-hmm. And uh, I hear, I hear someone like you speaking and it's like, you feel, you feel so fearless. You feel as if you have no reservation whatsoever. About <laughs> just, this is who I am. This is what I believe in. Yep. Well, and I think it, it really took me to get to rock bottom. Tyler, like it, it really took me to get to rock bottom to make that, to find that fearlessness. But go ahead, I'm, you're about to say. This is something that Vince and I used to talk about a lot. Vince Miller, who yeah. also worked with us at 3D Realms and uh, in the key. What is exactly is rock bottom for a guy like Tony? Because uh, so we look at you and we're like, this guy's perfect. He's he's sweet. He's handsome. He's he's gorgeous. He is like he's talented. He does everything right. That's the let's, end of the interview, right? So there. when you say rock, no, no, listen, listen seriously. Okay. okay so okay. Like, let's imagine that you're saying rock bottom is for you. I don't know what it is, and I'm open to being made to look like a jackass on this program. That's okay. You're not a jackass. But if it's time. if it's anything less than like sold your ass for crack, you're not gonna to me scare us away. You know, it, if that makes sense. Yeah. It, no, even if it were that, we would still look, we would be like, no, dude, like, we just, we just have so much respect for you as is. There's a, there's no competition right. for like how low do you have to sink to hit rock bottom. Right. So when people use that phrase, it's oftentimes like a challenge, mm-hmm. you know, like you have to show me how bad you want. Like, that's not how God works. It's not how like forgiveness works. No, but. I, I think rock bottom for in my case, and I'm again I'm I'm an open book. I don't mind sharing this story because it, it is of the past and it's 
I'm in such, I've been in such a better, we, gosh, my whole life has been so much better since this time. Um, but it, for me, it was, it was, it was when I, when I had thoughts of, of true suicide, true, just, I want nothing more to do with this life for me. That's a, that's a big one. The most evil thing that could ever be to just unalive yourself. It's, it's hard to, because I don't want to ever condemn someone who went through with it to, Mm -hmm. to say that like that their choice was evil. Right. I never want to put it that way. Correct. But I would say it's like the most horrible loss. It's awful. Someone feels hopeless. Right. Like they don't see what's right there in front of them, which is hope, which is their everyday faith is always there. Um, Right. To me. Uh, yeah. At least it had to have been every single time that I've been in that same uh, set of right. shoes. Right. So that's not an unfamiliar feeling to me, but what's scary is when that becomes such an overwhelming feeling to someone that's the choice they end up making. Right. Here. So my rock, yeah, my rock bottom was that, was number one, I want to remove myself from my life. And also that be- that became so all consuming that it you know, I had very angry outbursts. I, I, no physical, nothing physical. It was all verbal. I had a very, it was a very verbal type of angry outburst, um, that really put a wedge, a major wedge between me and my wife and, um, but praise God that we're, that. what's that? You had a whole life before that. What, what was it in your upbringing or, you know, like the years preceding that, that put you in a position because it wasn't your wife. No, of, of course, no. Gosh, she she was nothing. My my poor wife. I mean, she she's such a blessing. She she was she fighting was for us. She was fighting for us the entire time. But she was unfortunately the the on the receiving end. We both. I mean, I'm toward myself, and I toward my wife. She was just kind of on the receiving end of the problems I had within my own heart. Um, it really was. I think uh, at its core, if I'm it may sound silly, but at its core, it was, this is not what I wanted. Right. And I think there was an element of, I had all these dreams and all these aspirations and things weren't always working out and things weren't going as fast as I wanted. And it was a control issue, man. I mean, it was beyond anything else. I mean, and you could even, frankly, between you and me and those who listen, I guess, like, it really felt quite demonic because it also cropped up out of nowhere. It was also like, okay, my wife's house get health is getting better. Let's start talking about having kids. As soon as kids get came in, even, even in the discussion, I just grew very, I grew very fiery. I grew like, I don't want that. I don't want this. I don't want that. I don't even want to be alive. And that, especially in a marriage that's, you know, you ask about spirituality and a marriage that's really rooted in Christianity like that suddenly becomes a very big red flag when it's like, I want out. I don't want to be alive. I, you know, this marriage is over. You're better off with someone else, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was this, it became this circular, cyclical, just vicious cycle that little by little, night by night, I mean, we were at opposite ends of the room. And what, go ahead. what was your mom and dad's relationship like? If you love this show and you love supporting indie video games, please take a moment to check out In The Keep's upcoming Stellar Valkyrie. Built in the GZ Doom engine, this retro first-person shooter puts you in the universe of space bird bounty hunter Falco, who is on a mission to save his ex-girlfriend from the evil Black Star cult. Just type birdgame.space, that's B-I-R-D game dot S-P-A-C-E into your browser, hit enter, and smash that wishlist button. And stay tuned. And now, back to the show. You know, it was, it was, it's, if I'm being honest, pretty good. It's pretty good. I, I, I think, guess the ultimate question here is like, what is it that makes you afraid of a stable relationship? Yeah, that was the question. That was the and I, I'm totally on your side. Whatever it is that yeah. you say, I'm probably going to be like, yes. Finally, someone put it into words for me. But it's the same. Like, so I afraid think afraid of like believing in this could be possible. 
Well, there's that. Yeah. So there's the, there's the worth issues, right? So I, I had very low self-esteem despite what any of my social media might've looked at at this time. This was 2020. Um, it, it, there was the self-worth issues. And I think there was just the level of however you want to view it. But in my, you know, from my perspective is like, just what being so against what sort of God had intended for me right? Or what someone might say, what the universe has intended for them. Just frankly, going with the flow. Where where am I supposed to be versus where am I trying to force myself to be, right? So you have these ideas in your head. Oh, okay. Like I'm, I'm committing to these things in my head, but this is what life is giving you. These, these beautiful blessings, these beautiful things in your life, this is what life is giving you. And when you resist that, when you're constantly at resistance with life itself, with whatever is in front of you, if you're constantly resisting it, it's just, it's going to, it tore me apart. It's going to tear you apart. It's going to tear anyone apart because you're just, every day you are at odds with reality. And that's not to say you can't have dreams and aspirations and goals and working toward things, but I think it's so important to accept where you are, the challenges you're given, the responsibilities you're given, Stop distracting yourself and just get in there, get in the ice water, you know, <laughs> like, and I think that I, if, if for lack of better words, I feel like I just needed a real kick in the ass to wake up. And I think it took me to get to that point of like, just, I'm just going to live in my own little pretend world that I want this to happen with my life. And meanwhile, things that are actually happening in my life were just going in a completely different direction. And I wasn't really surrendering to it. I was just resisting it. And it just made me bitter. It made me angry. And unfortunately, I started taking it out on myself and just having an extremely short fuse. And now it feels like my fuse is as long as it is between here and the sun. Like it, it doesn't exist. There is no fuse because I'm like totally cool as a cat all the time. I mean, I don't my know how to describe it, man. Piece of advice to anybody at all is to just feel like, be like, be open to the idea that just because right in this moment, it doesn't feel like it's going to work out does not mean that it's not going to work out. Right. Like in any moment, it's going to cease. Like whatever's troubling you is going to just like some change. Right. It's going to have, there, there will be a slope. There will be a recognition of something. Um, like it, it's so strange to try to explain to someone who's, younger because they don't have as much data mm -hmm. to experience but if you think about it in terms of like climatology it's like the older you get the more climatology you have like oh i've seen the weather enough years and yeah. i kind of get the pattern yeah kind of figured it out you know over the course of you know 25 years that you get an idea right right and so when you're 29 and someone's 23 you can't expect them to have right. the same amount of data that you have right and it's like you just kind of hopefully grow to have patience for the fact that they'll get it. They'll understand yeah. there's a path. But I think, and but I think patience is the name, of the, the name of the game. You have to be patient with yourself and whoever else might be involved in whatever situation it is. Because the, I, I the look, most important thing, dude, is to be grateful to people, grateful to the people who are patient with you. Yes. That's you what know, I mean. Forget I, about patience for everybody else. It's like, that's tip of the iceberg. <laughs> yeah. Find people who give a fuck about you yeah. enough to be patient with you and your bullshit, and you have found the gravy train. Right. That's yeah. Yeah. And Maria, Maria, and I were just talking about this. So my wife's name is Maria. We were just talking about this the other night, like how it. How do I put this? That as awful as that situation was. And I take full responsibility. Like there's, there's no part of me that ever says, well, you know, okay, I'm, you know, it was just this, it was just that. No, it was me. I was an idiot. Like in short, I was dumb. But number one, how, how we have grown since then and how our marriage is flourishing now. And if we had given up, if I had given up on myself and if she had given up on me, we wouldn't have had the best like four years of our life since then. Like truly the best years of our life and our relationship, if we had given up on each other, it was really more so a battle between me and myself, you know, but if, if anyone at any moment gave up, what would it look like now? You know? Um, and that required patience and that required kind of just 
getting through a real crappy time to find to find growth and to find again like like almost like a flower blossoming i mean and that's what my next album is about it's like the last three years of how wonderful it's been so the next one's going to be real sappy <laughs> so, so i apologize in all, advance <laughs> let's talk about unkered and like what that yeah. album meant to you and like the yeah. music videos like you really went all out for this this mm-hmm. was a mm-hmm. kind of our first real branching off for you yeah uh, of course i know you from the call of Surrender soundtrack mm-hmm. Several other uh, really cool RPG video game soundtracks, but like seeing what you've done, uh, just on your own under the same name, nonetheless. Yeah. Al- always maintaining Tony Manfredonia as mm-hmm. the artist name, which is very brave. <laughs> Not a lot of artists would do that, you know. Like Garth yeah. Brooks didn't do that, right? Uh, you know, Kiss didn't even really do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, how does it feel to kind of get that off your chest? It was, it was everything I needed to put on paper. I never created it thinking it would be a a massive commercial success or would, you know, create a career that would, I don't know, I wouldn't even need to score soundtracks. Like I never went into it thinking that it felt, it felt divinely inspired, right? So this situation unfolded over the course, gosh, of like a, it was, it was, it was honestly such a short time in the scheme of life. I think it was like, it was like from like a April to July, like it was just this three month stress. It was just a nightmare, three month stress. Everything just somehow imploded overnight. Um, and so when we found healing, which again, I'm happy to talk about that part of the story too, because you ask about spirituality. When we found that healing, which I firmly and will die on the hill until I'm literally dead was a divine healing, a, a something miraculous took place. Something like finding the fairy fountain in uh, Zelda. Yes. People, people, but you know, find that in a game and they take it for granted and they find it in real life and they don't see it for what it is. And that's when you, you ask about how I seem so fearless. That's why is because it just, it was a life altering moment that once that happened, it was almost like just all the songs just kind of there was a there was a need to create it. I don't know why the need was there. There was a need to create it, to tell the story and to go all in with it and to not be afraid. I kept I kept getting that sense. Don't be afraid to really share the meat of it. And it really it's kind of a double album. It's kind of a short double album. It's 12 tracks. It's the first half is really about the awful stuff to number one, I suppose as like a uh, a restitution of sorts saying like, yes, this is what I did. And yes, I'm not proud of it, but this is what happened. And then there's the second half that's much more, more about the divine sort of inspiration, the divine healing, the the surrender to sort of a plan beyond one that I can comprehend. Like that's what the second half is about. And the reason why I include both is to, in case there's someone who hears it, who has gone through or is going through something similar, to be like, again, the word consolation, to be like, okay, so those angry outbursts I had, someone else went through it, but they they came out okay. Maybe I should pray a little more, or maybe I should do this. You know, so the whole point of it, the whole purpose behind it is tell the story as it is from your perspective, from my perspective, just to, sh- to share it as you, as it all unfolded and whatever else, again, forgive, forgive my, uh, just point blank statement here, but whoever needs to hear it, however they need to hear it and where they hear it, that's all in God's hands, man. Like that I've done my job wherever else it goes is beyond me. So you come from a predominantly Italian background in the Michigan. I'm actually from Philly. I'm actually from Jersey, Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia, basically like right across the river there. So, So then you, how did you end up in Michigan? My wife, we met online. Oh uh, my God. Oh my God. Oh, we're going to have like a, you know, how Sydney has the sewer thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have that for met my wife on the internet. On okay. This podcast You're never going to believe me I, when I say I met her on Tumblr. I swear to God. <laughs> Vince Steele, who you and I both know very yeah, well, yeah, yeah. met his wife on Fork Fortune. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love it. That beats Tumblr by a mile. That is amazing. And, the, and honestly, like the more of my, of my friends that I talk to nowadays, you know, where it's like I met my wife through X, and it's more and more stuff like that. And I'm like, I met my wife when we were stationed together in the military, yeah. and I feel really confident in myself. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, we met online. Uh, she she brought me here because I I will. It was, we, we just had blogs for like mental health stuff. You know, I was, we both, uh, well, I'll leave it at this. I, I was, I used to deal with really bad anxiety and, uh, like an eating disorder. And so I had kind of a blog about it and this was, oh, gosh, this was a long time ago now. This was like 2011, 12. No, you had to tell um, us about that. What's the, you had a, what, what eating disorder? I had, I had anorexia for a couple of years, a few years actually. Uh, probably Did like. Did come from having a grandmother that fed you too much food? <laughs> No, no. self worth. Think about it. You don't want if you if if you have no if you feel no worth. Why would you eat? I just wonder what encourages that in a child because I I I, I wouldn't say that I had I never got diagnosed with anything akin to anorexia. Just right. clear. Yeah. But I grew up in a world where everyone and I mean like no disrespect to family who's listening. Everyone except for me was morbidly obese, <laughs> you know. And I mean, imagine Mississippi, Alabama, like two right. thousands. Like th- this is you. the culture that I grew up in. You know, where like biscuits, can, biscuits and gravy is considered a healthy lunch, right? And everyone around me is like, "You're so skinny. You're so fucking. You know, look this or that." And I'm like, "No, I really think that I'm just." Actually, I work out and also yeah. don't eat garbage. Right, and they're they're like constantly eating fried chicken and fried you know pork chops and like mm-hmm. fried everything and lima beans and you know the whole shebang. And then you know then I have a whole generation of women surrounding me who have all had the same uh, surgery to like have the this tube put around their stomach to like restrict how much food they could eat. Yeah, and I'm just. On one hand, I'm like, yeah, I'm happy for you to get whatever treatment you need to feel healthy and happy. And on the other hand, I'm like, I've said that our culture has led you to you know this point where you you know you right. eat so much for comfort. Right. There are so many better drugs than just food. Yeah. Uh, you can smoke weed if you want. <laughs> True. <laughs> you can't. <Yeah>. Like, <laughs> like food is not the only drug available to you. And in fact, if you really want to eat more food, smoke more. Some more marijuana, <laughs> and you'll probably eat more food in turn, or or, or whatever it is for you. Like I don't yeah. really care about that. Like that's not, the point is, I just don't want people to grow up in a world where they feel uncomfortable, like being themselves, right. living the lifestyle that they want to live. Yeah, and you know the same to you. Um, but values become a, a really big debate, especially in the world that we live in right now. It's oh, like, for what, sure. What do we value? What do we endorse? What do we you know live for? Yeah. What do we stand for? Right. Um, that's a much harder question to answer than like, what am I willing to like, you know, what am I willing to live for or die for? Seems like a really difficult question until it's like in comparison to like, what am I willing to like actually stand up for? Right. Yeah, it's true. And I think that, you know, what am I willing to stand up for? I don't know how we've got to this point in the conversation. I'm trying to trace the, the, the dots here, but it doesn't matter. Um, I think I stand for commitment and uh if I'm being honest I stand for I think we need I think we need solid families. I think we need we need real solid families in our life today. That was another major impetus in my uh for the reason for my album was like we don't there's so much familial brokenness. And I'm not I'm not I'm not uh I'm not sort of outside of this brokenness either. Like there there is brokenness within my own family. Like it just, there is, but I think we need, we need, we need to get back to what it means to, to be able to love and also disagree. So I feel bad. I never really answered your question about spirituality. <laughs> We've got uh, like, uh, well, let's just start there. Like, okay. Where does, uh, where does your spiritual journey? Be? I was. I was born and raised, I what they would call like a cradle Catholic, like born and raised just in the Catholic world, the Catholic Christian world. Um, American Catholic. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and I'm still Catholic Christian by practice, by belief, by all of it. Um, now there was a period of my, my life, late high school, early college, probably for many Christians, uh, where I just, I kind of lost my way a bit and, uh, I did other things and whatever. I feel like I'm such a douche, Tony, and That's I funny. don't expect you to confess to all your sin. That's okay. I really suspect that what you consider the worst thing you ever did in your life <laughs> to me is like, I, I'm, I'm so scared. You're going to tell me what it is. I'm going to be like child's play. Yeah, no, you're probably right. I mean, you're probably right, but enough that. Uh, it doesn't matter. Like it does it not matter. change my opinion of you as a man or anything. Like, in fact, it makes me admire you more. It's like, oh my god, you're so pure. But at the same time, <laughs> it's like I'm so scared. You're gonna tell me like this is the worst thing I ever did in my life, and it's gonna be like I played hopscotch <laughs> with a girl who wasn't my wife, <laughs> and I'm gonna be like, oh my god. Yeah. Well, you okay. Know. We won't. We Please. Won't, we won't talk about the details in that in that regard. Just to save no. you your. Uh... <laughs> Please. Please do. I mean, I, I think it more it mostly it, it it felt like and I think just for my level of comfort, I, I I'll I'll leave it at this. I I feel like I just became very complacent with everything outside of spirituality, where like it just it didn't it didn't mean anything to me, you know. So like any 18, 19 year old college kid, you know, you just you do all the things that's on the college list. Let's leave it at that. So, an apologies if you hear cars going by. It's just stifling in this room, and I don't have air conditioning. Um, it's all good. It's all good. Um, but it was it was through Maria. So that's number one. That was sort of a, one of the ways we connected. Uh, was we discovered we sort of had mutual faith, and her family's you know kind of the same faith, and uh, well, exactly the same faith, and that was one of the sort of the conversations we had. And when we met through just comments and such on, on Tumblr and we just really seemed to click. And so my faith was, it's always been part of my life, but I don't think it's been until relatively recent times, really, you know, Maria has, has, has helped me grow in my faith. And she was just so, she's like a little saint. Uh, <laughs> she's so soft-spoken and uh, she's wonderful it, it, it sort of became my own, you know, or so it's like when you grow up with something, it's, you sort of do what your parents did and what your aunts and uncles did and blah, blah, blah in your school. But I, I think it was only really within the last decade that it's really become my own, that it really feels like I, we share this faith together in our own way. And this is how we do it. Um, if you took a poll and you were to ask like how many men turned to religion, because of the faith of a woman that they were with. Mm. If you had to answer that question, how how much do you think? If you had to guess. Oh wow! I mean, probably, probably quite a few. I, I bet it's a lot. I bet, I bet it's, it's a like lot. Yeah, way more than otherwise. Right. Like, and it's really like, what's going to make you believe more than anything? in the world than a healthy relationship. Like regardless right. of what that means, it could be man, woman, what, you know, like, yeah. who cares? I've just mean like, when you find the person in the, in your life, even if it's temporary, someone that you really love and you feel like you're like really connected to. Yeah. I mean, suddenly life moved very fast. Suddenly right. like everything starts to fall out of place and you make a lot of decisions and you do a lot of things and like, Perhaps that's exactly the right move for you. Perhaps it's just a branch on your journey. And I would never even go so far as to say a mistake. Like right. I don't really believe in mistakes when it comes to life. I think that you just kind of, you know, figure it out for yourself. Right. Uh, hopefully. Yeah. But and yeah. Go ahead. She, she really, um, again, I'm just going to point say a point blank. She really helped me shape up. She really helped me be a man. And I think not by way of cracking the whip necessarily, but by way of, hey, she really needs me in this situation or she really needs me in that situation. Hey, she really needs me when I'm beating myself up to the point of being suicidal. She still kind of needs me for these other things. And so in an, in an 
And of course, I need her for stuff too. I mean, I think that's the beauty of a relationship is what you kind of need each other. That's the whole point of it, right? <laughs> that's literally the whole point of it. Um, it she really helped me shape up. And of course, we had a we had a solid faith even, you know, in our early marriage years and all that. And it was really only the that situation where I was sort of losing my faith a bit and you know, like if, if God exists, then why would I, why would I, you know, why would this be happening or why would that not be given to me or blah, you know, all these ridiculous kind of claims. But it was in that moment of, I'll never forget it. It was one night I was up, I was up so late. There's a song, actually, if, if anyone wants to hear the song of this very night, you can hear it. It's called Satan's Game. This yeah. sort of almost like a conversation with Satan is sort of how the song is Create. I know. You, I know that you remember me sending you the uh, Ray Wildley Hubbard's conversation yes. with the devil. Yeah, of course. The uh, devil went down to Georgia. Right. There's so many beautiful songs throughout history that are the conversation between a man who's trying to stand his ground and yeah. uh, confronting the, the demon. And this is all pretty much a metaphor for Jesus's, uh, you know, experience in the desert. Right. With Satan tempting yes. him. But it's all the same story. Um, but your take on it was so unique and so beautiful and so your own. And I really just wanted to congratulate you on you, like you know, taking an old trope and turning it into something that was really <laughs> uniquely yours. Thank you. Yeah, I kind of took the, I kind of took the Jekyll and Hyde approach with it, where yeah. it's my voice throughout, but it's almost like a conversation with myself and the demon within, if you want to think of it that way. And, um. It, I, I'd think less of you if I thought you, you know, if I thought there was no demon within there, I'd be like concerned. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if I yeah. met a human being who I thought like there's nothing. Yeah. In there, like, Are you an ape man? What's yeah, wrong right. With you? Exactly. Uh, it was that very night. I was up so late. I mean, and I'm, I'm an early to bed, early to rise kind of guy. I was up all night because I was grappling with, to the point where. You know, you could, I suppose you could say, you could blame the sleep, but it really felt like there was this, it just felt like there was just, om yeah, like almost like there's literally a demon on your shoulders, just like, you know, poking at you. Like I just felt so unsettled. That was, that was one night of my entire life that has ever happened to me where I literally stayed up throughout the entire night from the previous evening to the next morning, just in thought, trying to keep myself alive kind of situation. And, uh. It was that point that I got on my knees that next day. Well, Maria, Maria, she handed me a letter because of course we were, we were barely talking and she handed me a letter and she said, she said, I don't know why I feel called to give you this letter, but it feels like no matter when I tell you something verbally, it's not sticking. So maybe something in writing will make a dent. So she wrote this and I'm not even going to disclose anything that it says, but she wrote me a very well loving, but firm worded letter. Very firm, but very loving. I'm just picturing the lyrics to uh, Write This Down by George Strait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually. Um, yeah. And it Pretty was- Pretty close. Pretty yeah. close. I'm, I'm going to leave it at, at what, I, what I just said. The, uh -huh. the, the, what end, it was, it was after I sort of snapped to a little bit that I remember, I remember getting on my knees and saying, you know, Lord- like this is in your, like it is, it's your turn. It's like, I have tried to get out of this myself. Maria's tried getting out of this. We've all, we've all done our part. Like it's in your hands, man. Like you take over. And it was after that moment that sort of this chain reaction started coming into place that, you know, our, so our priest, our, our parish priest, uh, I, I just felt, you know, we, I called him. I was like, Hey, like, would you mind just like praying with me or just like praying over me to, you know, and he knew, of course he knew all we were, we were both seeing him just kind of in our own way, just as this was all unfolding. Cause for spiritual direction, I guess. But so he knew the situation and I, he said, sure. So we both met, um, Marie and I, we went together to go and there was a team of sort of prayer, like a prayer team, if you want to think of it that way. And in fact, if you want to watch the music video, uh, the song is called Visions from God, which is really about that moment. Um, and the music video kind of tries to recreate the scenario a bit 
uh, the, we were getting prayed over and, and I remember saying, you know, what do you want to pray for? And then the thought that came to mind was discernment, you know, praying for discernment of this marriage of my, of our future. And especially because the idea that having children together was sort of really, there was such a, there was such a divide there. She was like, well, I want kids. Well, and I was saying, no, I don't want nothing to do with kids. You know, there was this, there was a, there was an aversion to it. So that's very important to, 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 to mention. There was a complete aversion. Like, I don't want to deal with kids. I just want to make music. I, I just, I don't want anything to do with having a family. Right. So Stop. wait, yeah, why are ahead. the two mutually exclusive? They're not. So now obviously but, I can't but, wait. To- yeah. But why, do, like, why do all men arrive at that same conclusion in, I don't in know, their man. mid, mid twenties to thirties? Yeah. It's always like this. If I Either have kids, or. somehow that's going to, that's somehow that's going to prevent me from doing the things that I dream of. I don't and know. That's, Never the case for any historical yeah. character. That you can think <laughs> I know. Of. Like, you know. It's like. Didn't J.S. Bach had like 11 kids or something crazy? Think, you know, Bob Marley had more children than he could possibly dream of and did nothing except for make a bunch of good songs. Yeah. You know, oh, so know. if you're doubting you could be an influential musician and have a bunch of kids, you're yeah. doubting yourself way too hard. Yeah. Um, I, know. I, but I, I, I wish I could turn back the clock and just smack myself over the head. But I know what you mean, where yeah. it's like that I, I had this until I was, honestly, until I met the right girl. Yeah. It was like, it didn't matter how old I was, how, you know, what I believed in, anything like that. It was like until I met someone that I really believed, like, you're right. the mother of my children. Right. Like, this is who I'm supposed to do that with. Right. Um, yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's part of it. Yeah. I mean, now, and we, we don't have kids yet, but God willing, you know, again, if you're a person of faith, pray for us. I mean, we're just, we're just, we're waiting whenever, whenever it happens, it happens, but it, it, uh, I couldn't be more excited. Right. So in that moment, in that I'm, moment, I'm sorry. I love how whenever it happens, it happens. It's such, it's such a Christian way of getting out of like, we're not trying to prevent it. I, I'm, I agree. I grew up around too many people like you to not read it for whatever reason. No, no, no. I mean, and I'm not, not letting you off the hook. No, all I'm saying, man, is like, I'm. So, I've never been more pumped. I've never been more pumped to have kids. Um, <laughs> I mean it sincerely. I mean it sincerely. Like, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And so, it's that, it's that time. How old are you now? I'm 31. Uh, so. You're like two years older than I am. <laughs> I always way. think of you as like 45. No, I'm, I'm like, by no means 45. But uh, but I feel like I'm supposed to be at your level by the time I'm your age. Oh, now. no. <laughs> no, I've just been through. I've been through enough to know uh, what I need to do with my life. But it's uh, it it was in that moment. We were we were really, I mean, he had he had his hands on my head and, uh, you know, the other the other individuals there. I mean. They were really, they were really praying with us and and over us in a way. And it was in that moment where it was almost like if you can, if you can kind of picture in your mind's eye, like watching a a film or a storybook or whatever, just a bunch of images of 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 like my future kids or my unborn kids. You know, like there's just this clear as day, like I can't, I can't not think about having my own children. And, uh, I mean, it obviously moved me to, to, to tears. I mean, it was because there was such a joy behind it. It was like a, something I've never felt prior to that, where it was like, wait a minute. So in this moment, I went from wanting nothing to do with having kids to now I can't wait literally in the fraction of a second and that hasn't changed, man. I mean, it's been three years or three and a half years since that, since that moment. And it's like, I literally like it, it feels like everything I just can't wait to do. Um, and so in my experience, just given, and again, my, I've never had anything even remotely close to feeling angry since then. It really felt like a miracle. And I may sound ridiculous if anyone who I know hears this, they're and if you think I'm nuts, fine. But I will die on this hill of like it it was a it was an altering, a life altering moment that number one, 
saved our marriage because it, 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 all it took for us to reconnect was to say, we're on the same page about having kids and like being enthusiastic about it. And so that happened. And then of course, like all the anger issues just sort of just seemingly somehow went away and there was never any issue after that. It, I mean, it's to me, wild. it seems like in your life, putting out anchored was such a big cry out for like, fish. I'm getting this off my chest. It was less. And, of, then, it, and, and listen, real quick. Go for it. Yeah. Notice, notice the uh, phonetic connection between the word anchored and angered. Mm. And you're like, you really like put that out there in the world. Mm -hmm. Other people saw that. Even if yeah. it wasn't as many as you hoped for or whatever. So yeah. People saw that. Yeah. That's you. And it's beautiful. Like it's, it's really brave to even do something close to them. Well, thank you. But I think, again, I think it was, I wouldn't be able to tell you the exact scripture passage, but there's a, there's throughout, throughout the Bible, throughout the new Testament, there's so many moments where Jesus will, you know, he'll heal a blind man or he'll he'll raise the dead. And the first thing he'll say is don't tell anyone. And what do they do? They run to town and they tell everybody. That's the feeling, man. That's, that is, that is the feeling of why anchored happened. Let's get back to this. Yeah. My older brother, uh, who is yeah. very similar to you with like, a, yeah. I, I really genuinely hope that like at my future wedding, the two of you meet. Oh, sure. Because you'll, you'll get along so well. Yeah. You're like, you're the same kind of like really super positive personality, but always very grounded in your faith. Kind of yeah. Thing. And so if you were to have that same conversation with him about me, hmm. it would be such a weird uh, juxtaposition. Sure. Because he, he knows me as like, I grew up and you know, you, you know me as I am. As I grew up. Yeah. Um, but to, to back up a little bit, do you ever think about the idea that uh, communication is all centered around the Tower of Babylon? And like, does that story stick out to you? Because I, I wonder, uh, I've never been, even though I'm Irish by yep. you know, heritage, I've never been raised Catholic. Mm. Um, so do you get that story as part of your like yearly journey throughout the Bible? Uh, the Tower of Babel, it does, it will, you know... I yeah, I'll reflect on it here and there, but I, my, my personal interpretation of it and someone out there who like knows theology through and through will probably disagree on me with this, but I, I definitely right. see the story of the tower of Babel as like a moment of division for the human race, similar to, if you want to think of it like Adam and Eve, right? So the temptation of defying God is, is being one. And then also the idea of trying to reach God or trying to be God essentially is going to divide the people. Language can be, can be that uh, dividing barrier now, but I'm also, I also want to make it very clear that I'm not saying, well, there's one true language. Like I think it's beautiful that we can all communicate even without saying anything, we can communicate through our eyes. And I think there's also, there's that as well. So oh, of course, it's not I just want to be very clear that I'm not saying like, English is the master race. Like I'm not saying, trust me, I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> You're talking to a guy who's built a career on a uh, red octopus logo. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> yeah. You know, like uh, if you want to get real, real canonical about it, like I've, I've put on a red octopus logo and I beat up my best friend who's Jewish. I I don't think that's a good look for any it's corporation. A, it's not a good look <laughs> to beat someone up, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially not in this context, but like yeah. that's not the point. Yeah, you know, that never was the point, and it will be. Uh, but yeah, I, I totally get what you mean. It's uh, it's interesting because you're constantly engaging with a new idea of what how the world should work and how the people should interpret what you're supposed to be talking about, what they're supposed to be thinking. Um, you know, we started off this this little branch of the conversation, basically talking about like what's it like to what's it like to disagree with your family? What's it like to disagree with your you know? inner circle of like religious groups or whatever mm -hmm. we live in such a bigger world now we live in in a world where people have to constantly kind of second guess that everything that they say because they're afraid they're going to scare someone away and i just don't think that's a healthy way of living it's you should I, be, yeah. yeah i agree with you i mean for example it's like and i've got a I, you know you mentioned you mentioned someone of of, of jewish uh, faith, like one of my best friends, he's Jewish and he's awesome. We talk about this kind of stuff all the time and it's great. We disagree, but we, we talk about, 
we talk about our disagreements, but it, we're still like best friends. So like, I think the ideal scenario is if you could throw the Pope, for example, or like the, like a diehard super trad Catholic and an atheist in the same room and have them share a meal, have them talk about it, talk about their lives, talk about whatever they believe or whatever they don't believe in. And they walk away with a hug and life goes on. I, it almost feels like we've lost the ability to do that, especially on social media. Gosh, you say- The you ultimate say, tragedy you, is people who don't believe in anything. It's like, you, know, I, you I, believe I, it. I, you know, even if you're an atheist, you believe in atheism. All yeah. right, cool. Well, you have a belief. <laughs> We're at 50% of the way there. Yeah. Like, <laughs> done. You know, that, that's easy to work with. But if it's like, I just- I don't know what I believe in. I don't have any idea. Like that's what's scary to me. That's what's like. You have no ideals, no direction, no guiding principles. Um, well, I, I think between you and me, from my observation, is that even those who don't believe in anything, quote unquote, they put their, now again, forgive me here for a second, but like, there is an inherent need for worship in humanity. It's inherent. Whether anyone wants to agree with me or not, we need, as a human race, there is inherent need and instinct, if you want to think of that way, to worship something. Now, do you see a lot of people worshiping politicians? Absolutely. Arguably, it's in our DNA. Correct. Yeah. Correct. It is within us. And so I think what can end up happening is for those who may or may not believe in X, Y, or Z, well, they may put their worship into their career. They may put their worship into, again, politicians is a big one these days, right? Like who's God and who's Satan essentially in, in politics. I mean, it's, it's as clear as day when you go on the internet. So it, I, I think it, 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 is a, it is a big problem. It is a big problem that we, we, as a whole, not everybody, obviously, but as a whole, largely society doesn't really know how to disagree. Society doesn't know how to disagree and be okay with it. And that, that, I mean, especially after the pandemic and the recent political stuff over the last eight years, like there have been broken, gosh, I mean, heck my last song was kind of touched on that where there's just, there's there's a disconnect within within friend groups, family groups, whether blood family or step families, whatever, like all because you have different beliefs about X, Y, or Z. They can't even sit down and eat a meal together. That's a problem. That's a problem. If they're not punching you, if they're not putting you at gunpoint, if there's no physical or major threat to your existence by being near them. I think we need to we need to find a way to get back to sitting down with people who we may not share the same beliefs. Thank you for listening to In the Keep. Please consider taking a moment to leave a review, comment, a like, and subscribe on your listening platform of choice. It really helps. It's greatly appreciated. If you really love the show and want to see it grow, consider supporting us by Patreon. Supporters get episodes early, exclusive content and updates, chances to ask questions to guests access to In The Keeps video games, and whatever else I can do for you. Every little bit helps. This podcast directly supports my ability to do what I love the most and to take care of my growing family. You can find links to everything that I'm talking about here over at inthekeep.com. Thank you, bless you, and enjoy the show. It's a, it's a really weird thing that you bring up because earlier in the conversation you were talking about like just having a conversation and just sitting at the table. Yeah. Um, and that's such a huge part of it. I remember back in, uh, you know, the nineties, maybe even the early two thousands, Nickelodeon, Nick at night had this, okay. like they had this agenda that was like the, the, you know, the, the family table. Right. And it was like this, you know, constantly showing scenes of people in the sitcoms who were like, you know, the whole family sitting at the dinner table and have dinner together. Mm -hmm. and like reinforcing that as a value and it seems it seems so silly because i grew i don't know about you but i grew up in that like lock key 
kid generation where it was like, you know, you're lucky if you fucking brown the hamburger and eat before mom gets home and make the hamburger. <laughs> yeah. Help him. And, and, yeah. and yeah. if not, you're making it yourself and you and that's what you and your brother are eating and good luck. Yeah. And which I, I, I consider a merit, but I also am like, you know, that there's something missing from that. You know, I, I listen to somebody like Tucker Carlson talk about like every night my family has dinner together. Like, God, that must be amazing to be fucking rich and uh, <laughs> have the time for your whole family to have dinner yeah. together. You yeah. Fucking piece of shit. Uh, but also like you, you know, Gosh. They, I, I have nothing to get. I don't know Tucker Carlson. If I ever met him, I'm sure we'd probably get along. To yeah. be honest. But it's just like, you know, I think that it's an important value for every family. Like this is the basis for having a healthy relationship with your life is every family has meals together every day. And I'm like, just, it's not a fucking realistic standard. You piece of shit. Every day is not realistic. However, I think well, even, even once later, a week is worth dropping. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, that's great. Yeah. I think even later in life, and I have a lot of personal experience with this. I think even later in life, just, I'm not even going to mention names, but let's just say, you know, for example, let's say so-and-so brother votes for X, sister votes for Y, brother believes X, sister believes Y. They should still be able to communicate. They should still be able to sit down if there is a family gathering, for example, and sit down because they're your sibling, they're your father, they're your mother. Okay. Again, if there is abuse involved or if there's something really bad, okay, obviously, yes, I get that. I understand that. But I think nowadays it's like people are afraid, as you mentioned, people are afraid to say anything of meaning because they're afraid they're going to offend somebody. Well, I'm sorry to say, but it's like, it's okay to believe in something. It's okay to share that you believe in something. That's okay. Because you're going to find people who also believe in that with you. You may offend somebody if they're weak in the knees about whatever the topic is. Okay, fine. They'll survive probably, but it's, it's important to believe in something. If nothing else, it's important to believe in yourself that you believe in something and to, to, to talk about it, to share it. Again, I go back to the message of anchored. You know, you mentioned, you think of it, or you, you mentioned that it might have been a, a response of, um, sort of, a and it was therapeutic in a way to sort of process the whole situation, of course, of course. But I think it was more so, I can't contain this. I can't contain what I believe. I can't contain what happened to me. And I want other people to experience, to even give them a fraction of what I experienced. It felt listening to you in that record, like, I mean, not to compare you to the, the, the goat, but to compare you to the goat. It was almost like an Eminem level of burying your soul. Yeah. Just in a completely opposite sort of like lifestyle sort of situation. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So like listening and both of you from Detroit, no, no, no difference, you know, right. In, in regards of the kind of proximity to the area, the culture is all mm -hmm. the same. It's just that, you know, you're a good boy and he's not. <laughs> but to me, <laughs> when I listen to, you know, uh, the real Slim Shady, and I hear him talk very raw, open, honest about mm. this is what my experience has been, and how hard, how hard that's been, how difficult that's been, how right. you know all of that, laid it out all out on the table, and then just live his life, right? And they're on, and you do the same thing. It's just you know, it's not necessarily uh, you know the world's biggest hip hop record, no. But that's not what's important. It's what's important is that you're actually bearing your soul and kind of like really being honest about what it's like to like grow up in the, the shoes that you grew up in and to face the the difficulty and the problem that is to find and like uh, find security within love right which is not something that everyone gets to experience well so and that's and that's yeah thank you and i mean it i think rawness is is needed more than ever I think we need, we need more stuff that's raw. And again, I find one of the biggest where I, I mean, if I ever get bubbled up these days or feel like I just need to say something, it's, it's between you and me, man. Sometimes it's even within the game industry. 
where you have people their their life and God bless them and I and I I they're amazing they're amazing people I'm sure but it 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 can make me feel so sad when their life revolves around the next release of whatever the game is their calendar is based upon a video game release schedule and I work in the game industry shit we really care about man fuck all that stuff you know like we we know that's all nonsense I got we I've worked in that you've worked in that yeah we've seen but I I. I think where where I start to get sad is there's so much to life. There's so much more to life than screens and distractions and and I think, you know, so the idea of 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 raw music or raw content or raw media, stuff that just again, it gets into the mud. It's like here's what I'm dealing with. Here's what they're dealing with. Here's the questions of faith and life and death and heaven and hell and the universe. We need it. I'm sorry. Like we, and I get very passionate about this, so forgive me, but I feel like we, we, we need to start thinking about this stuff again. I think, especially in America, definitely, mm-hmm. especially in America, we've grown so comfortable. We go in, we do our job, we, we go home, we watch our Netflix, then we go open up our phone and then we go to bed and we start our day with our phone and rinse, repeat. Where are you taking time to just sit with yourself? I don't want to give the wrong message. So I want to make sure I'm clarifying my message here. Like I've got nothing wrong with being excited about video games. For a great example, I've been playing World of Warcraft since 2004. The latest expansion just came out early access. I got the early access version. I'm all about geeking out and having a good time. But I think it's um, the point I'm trying to make is it's so important to strike balance and to, especially with how technologically driven our world is, it's so important more than ever, I'd say, to make sure we're doing an equal amount, if not more, outside of the technology stuff. That's all I'm trying to say. That's it. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think that it's important to remember that there's a deeper message beyond whatever is personal to us. Right. Beyond whatever is like, you know, like strictly within our grasp. Right. And uh, since you have a limited amount of time left, I will also say like what we have time to discuss today. There's always the future. There's always more to be talked about. There's always yeah. more to be uncovered. Um, one of my most, uh, the most amazing revelation about this entire career that we have, you know, in video games at all, is that, you know, no matter how crazily weird and like stupid and selfish that it seems to even be indulged in such a, you know, lucrative, weird community, yeah, <laughs> there's it's still a struggle of something. Yeah. It's like, why is that? Yeah. Um, no, dude, you're doing amazing. Like you're doing an incredible job of I'm like a huge, I'm a huge fan of yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. I just try to keep it real, man. I try to keep it real because I think. Remember Chappelle shows, keep one, keeping it real goes wrong. Yeah. I think I spent too much of my life in fear, in doubt, self-doubt. Because between you and me, man, all I ever wanted to be was on stage with an orchestra. When I started writing music, I guess I was 16, 17. It was with me and a piano and a microphone. It was songs. And I loved the performative human connection. And then it was maybe a little bit earlier where, you know, I, again, I grew up with, grew up with World of Warcraft. So I, I loved orchestra music. When I saw Coldplay perform their song Politic at like the 2003 Grammys, I think I watched the recording probably in 2008 or so. Um, they had an orchestra. That was sort of my that was sort of my gateway into saying I want to do that. I I want to be like these guys and have an orchestra behind them and sing them. I'm sing seeing like songs. Metallica S and M. S and M man, oh, yes, hundred percent. It's a brilliant album, and I geek out about it all the time. S and M is it it the arrangements Honestly, it's, are it's just like, it's, brilliant. It's like not even that good. It's just good enough it's i mean the arrangements were well done come on i'm saying i'm saying you would do better you would do better i might have made some changes but (laughs) (laughs) now in all seriousness it's it's uh i spent when i got into games i spent so basically almost a decade of saying nah no one will take me serious if i try to do this like songwriter meets orchestra thing no one will take me seriously no one will take me seriously no one will take me seriously i just kind of lived in this box i lived in this box man and it was when I saw, he's a huge inspiration to me and I'd love to buy him coffee. I met him briefly after his last show and he 
probably doesn't remember me because he looked exhausted. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if he was tired or not, but either way, he was, he just wanted to go to bed. I'm sure. Uh, Cody Fry, when I saw, when I met Cody Fry and I saw him perform, he's basically a songwriter orchestrator. Basically Ty, he's doing what I'm doing, but on a much bigger scale in a much better way. <laughs> he's, he's got a, you know, record label. I mean, he's, he's killing it. Who when to I see you in your mind is the most star, the, the most starstruck person you would be to me. If I were to meet Chris Martin from Coldplay, I don't even know if I would be awake. Like I would faint that hard. So he's like, he's like the most starstruck, but I, I, from a more professional level, I would love to sit down. Cody Fry is, I would love to sit down with him for, as professional to professional, just to say, thank you for helping me get out of my box. Cause when I saw him and his, he had, it was a sold out show down in Ann Arbor, down right by Detroit, sold out show with an orchestra. Him playing his, and singing his songs. When I saw that in 2022, I was like, or maybe it was 2023. Either way, when I, it was a sort of a confirmation for me. I was like, if this guy can do this, why have I been living in my little box saying I have to just only talk about game music and only do this and only be that and only do this? Why can't I just? So that's how I felt with the whole, you know, Bill and Shooter thing. Yes. I want to be able to do anything that I want. I want to be able to talk about whatever comes to mind. The hard I want part. To shy away from the hard questions in life just because yeah. it might be not be marketable for, you know, your game. That's right. Right. Boring. And I think that's the the question that even just I literally I think it was if not last night then two nights ago I was saying I was like Maria, I was like, I was like, Maria, do I do I like split my things? Do I do like, you know, this music over here with that name and I at the end of the day, I'm like, you know what? I we shouldn't have to we shouldn't have to be that way. If you and I, me and you, Ty, we were made to be interested and be a bit more multifaceted, you and I cannot be the only ones in the universe who feel this way. No. So you talk about marketing. We're, we're probably actually the majority, just not the most represented. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good way to put it. Uh because that's the thing. When I when I like a great example is if I were to go to like GDC which I have never been to GDC, by the way. I've been making this career work somehow by never going to GDC. That's fine. Um, Why? I would, I would like to go one day, maybe once, but it's it's so expensive and I, it's not been on the cards. Um, it would probably be on my dime when it actually happens, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be, maybe one day we'll see. I'd, I'd love, I'd love to go really would love to go. But either way, like when I go to, if I were to go to something like that, I don't want to talk about, and I'm sure the conference, that'll be the conversation starters, like the plugins and like, what is your favorite software? Or like, what, how, what's your workflow or what's your favorite game? You know, go down that low. Okay. Get those out of the way. I want to know, like, what are you interested in? What do you do in your free time? What do you, how do you have fun? What's your faith like? Are you married? Do you got kids? You know, like I, this is, those are the questions I want to connect to people with. One of the most interesting games that I played uh, last year and uh, several different conferences that I went to, but this was EGX in uh, okay. London. Sure. Uh, this game was called uh, Meat Locker. I don't know. Something to do with meat. <laughs> Super Meat Boy? Yeah. No, 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 no. Wake up with them. It was like a tied into chat GPT. Sure. And it's like you're an interrogator. Right? You're supposed to interrogate like the witness. Okay. And basically like she is a woman. Her husband has been murdered. You know she knows why. Sure. But you have to interrogate her in a way that she admits to it. That's the name of the game. Yeah. It's extraordinarily hard. Okay. I can imagine. But it's really, really cool. And so then like that, that puts me in a position where I'm looking at games, you know, that are coming out right now. Like, what are we going to be dealing with in terms of what, not necessarily what's novel, because that is novel. That is something that's interesting. Is it something that people are going to be paying for? Mm. Is there a market for that? Is mm -hmm. there a, uh, you know, and the, that's always going to be the question mm -hmm. that we have to deal with as, as indie game designers, as whatever within our industry uh it's it's a, a never-ending question of what is the market value of what you're putting in right um to me you're as 
not as good as you're like you're better than most of what people pay for for you know a classical soundtrack for a you know RPG game. I appreciate that. My imposter syndrome is raging, but I appreciate that. <laughs> it's true, man. If you made the soundtrack to you know Ace Combat Two, I, w- I definitely would have still played the game. Probably enjoyed it more. Yeah, <laughs> so, man. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, marketability on all fronts is tough. But either way, it's uh, yeah. It's tough. So I'm sorry that to say that I only have five minutes left. No, we're uh, we're closing up right now. That's why I'm trying to like do the whole, you know, like yeah, you know, you did so great on the soundtrack. I'm trying <laughs> to do like do the closing parts. See, the, the problem is that I can I would happily talk about all of this stuff for the next two hours, but I I do. My wife is waiting. <laughs> in the last five minutes, just tell us kind of like what you know what what's important to you in your life. What do you, what do you strive to uh, leave behind after you're gone? Let me think about that for a second. Cut out this silence when you produce this. <laughs> I'm probably gonna leave my laughter in. That's fine. I think you can never replace. You can never replace what's right in front of you, ever. Whether that's, again, maybe it's your relationship, your family, your maybe your work, whatever it is. Whatever's right in front of you is what's right in front of you. It's so important to the legacy, the message, the everything that I want. I if I die tomorrow, I would I would love nothing more than for this to be what people remember me by is. What is right in front of you is, is almost always the most important thing on your list. Unless it's obviously like, okay, well, what's right in front of me is, I don't know, cocaine, <laughs> whatever it is. Like I'm saying, I'm saying both literally and figuratively. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, but like, let's say, let's say, you know, your fa- like the, the work that you have right now versus the work you want to do or the relationship right now or the state of the the way your relationship is in right now versus what you want it to be. There's nothing more important than what is literally right on your doorstep and taking action on that day for that day as present as you can be. Because you can worry about tomorrow all you want. It's not going to change it. You can worry about the next year all you want. It's not going to change what you got to do right now or what you you need to focus on right now. And so I think just being present, walking with love and trying to be happy, healthy, and strong, like strong in what you're doing. It's critical. It's critical to be just firmly rooted in what you're doing right here, right now. Don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow be for tomorrow. Do what's right here in front of you. Being in the present, it's always a strong point of view no matter what culture you're from no matter what religion you're from it's always correct a focal point of it so i would say tony manfredonia uh we have less than three minutes with you know free me to legally get rid of you based on what sure. you said so far sure so uh i just want to say i love you man you're amazing a, a, a true act an accolade a uh a pillar amongst the men that you stand amongst you know uh even amongst our team someone that I think everyone on the team looks up to so just uh, keep doing what you're doing Uh, we're always going to be behind you and uh, God bless thank you Ty God bless thank you appreciate your time much love to the wonderful the great the powerful Tony Manfredonia one of my best friends I am so happy to have spent this time with them there's no way we I don't know. That that conversation was a lot, and yet I uh, feel like we didn't get to everything that I wanted to get to. So we've already agreed to do a part two at some time in the future and uh, cover some more of that stuff, maybe in a little bit more organized of a way. Uh, but definitely go to you know Tony Manfredonia's website. I'll put it all in the show notes and everything. Check out all of his music, his rock albums, his classical music, his game soundtracks. Uh, the guy is, a, is, is an incredibly talented dude. And I have nothing but love and respect for you, Tony. I hope you're uh, hope you're doing great out there. Uh, if you're listening to this and you haven't already, subscribe to our Patreon. You can do that right now. You can also donate, uh, you know, in lots of other less less committed ways. 
all of the links are over on inthekeep.com on the support page if you want to check that out. Oh my goodness, I gotta thank everybody. I gotta pull up that page again to do it though, because I keep running and running around and like forgetting where I put my tabs. You guys ever do that? Like, have too many tabs open? It's kind of a thing, right? Oh lord. Oh my goodness, where are they at? Right here. Thank you to Shannon, Ann, Michael, Fred, Brad, Dots, all of the people who are in the In The Keep Discord. That's at discord.inthekeep.com, by the way. Check that out and uh, be part of our little community. Oh, we're getting right up around Halloween time. and We've been talking a lot about spirituality and uh, ghosts and goblins and stuff recently. I've been really fascinated by the subject, and I would like to hear from you. So uh, if you jump in that Discord, I'll even make a channel for it or something. But uh, I want to hear your ghost stories. I mean, real ghost stories, not any of that bullshit. So, uh, yeah, definitely write in and tell me about it. And if it's really good, I might read it on a future episode. Happy Halloween, folks. Uh, that'd be really fun. And to kind of dive into that topic a bit more, I think I'll search out some experts and have them on the show, maybe. Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, but for now, I love you. God loves you. And until next time, stay in the keep.